إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار only a few weeks have passed since we saw riots spread across this country. We all saw the hatred directed towards Islam and towards the Muslims. We saw the masajid being vandalized. We saw Muslims being abused and spit upon. We saw asylum seekers, many of them from Muslim countries, being physically attacked. And we even saw some of the graves of the Muslims being desecrated and defiled. And even though this latest round of riots has passed, we all know that at any moment, once again, this hatred could be started and directed once again towards the Muslims. And so we ask, what is the correct response? What should we do? What is the right thing to do when these things occur? The answers to these questions, like all others, can be found in the Quran and the Sunnah. By the light of their guidance, a Muslim lives his or her life. When we look to the Quran and the Sunnah, the first thing that we realize is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that He will test us in this life. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lamim, Ahasib al Nasu, Ayyut Raku, Ayyakul Amanna, Uhum la yuftanun. Allah says, Alif Lam Meem, do people think that they can just say, we believe, and then they will be left alone and they will not be tested? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes clear, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ And verily we tested the people before them. فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to know who are those who are truthful when they say, we, we believe. وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ And Allah will know who are the liars. Who are the ones just full of empty talk? That as soon as times get hard, times get tough, they run away from Islam. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes clear that the persecution and the abuse that the Muslims suffer at the hands of the disbelievers, this is part of Allah's plan. Allah has made it clear that this is part of His plan, part of His divine purpose. As Allah says, لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, He allows this persecution to occur to separate the impure from the pure. So that He can see who are the diamonds amongst mankind. Who are the rubies? Who are the precious ones? The gems amongst the believers. And who are the filthy and the impure? Ibn Kathir, one of the great scholars of tafsir, he said, explaining this verse, فَمَعْنَ الْآيَةِ إِنَّمَا أَبْتَلَيْنَاكُمْ بِالْكُفَّارِ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ لِيَتَمَيَّزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ Ibn Kathir, he said that the meaning of the verse is that Allah is saying, we only test you with these disbelievers fighting you, throwing bricks at you to separate the pure from the impure. Just like the swordsmith. You know, in the past, the swordsmith, when he would make the swords, he would take the steel and put it in the furnace and heat it up then he would take it out and he would hammer it and pound it. Then he would put it back in the furnace and heat it again and then bring it out and pound it. The more he pounds it, the stronger the steel becomes until finally it becomes unbreakable. And so likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tests us with these disbelievers, 
pounding us again and again until our faith also becomes unbreakable. Secondly, how should we respond? The Prophet ﷺ also taught us this. Once a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Sidi, give me advice, give me a wasiyah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gave him a brief advice. He said, La taqdab, don't get angry. Meaning, don't act when you are angry. And so again the man said, give me more advice, give me more advice. And every time, the Prophet ﷺ said the same thing. La taqdab, don't get angry. The scholars of hadith, they said the reason that the Prophet ﷺ kept repeating these words is to teach the man and to teach us this is enough as advice. This is enough as a wasiyah. If we just lived our lives by these words, this would be enough. We wouldn't need anything else. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِسُرَعَةِ The strong one is not the one who overcomes the others in wrestling. It's not the way that you people think that the strong one is the one who is big with muscles. He overcomes the people when he fights them in wrestling. إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ the Prophet ﷺ, he said, no, the real strong one is the one who restrains himself when the anger rages inside. Someone may say, yes, but if I saw someone put paint on, on the grave of my father, throw paint on the grave of my mother, how can I not get angry? Yes, brother, we would all get angry. But what the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us is that when that anger comes, we are not meant to speak and we are not meant to act. And this is why Salman al-Farsi, radiallahu anhu, when he was asked the same thing, when a man came to him and said, give me advice. And you know that Salman, he was one of the scholars amongst the Sahaba. So Salman, he gave him the same advice as the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa He said, don't get angry. The man said, you are telling me to do something I cannot control. How can I control my emotions? I can't control when I'm happy or sad or mad. So Salman, he said, Salman, he said, فَإِنْ غَضِبْتَ فَأَمْلِكْ لِسَانَكَ وَيَدَكْ he said, then when you get angry, then restrain your tongue and restrain your hand. Meaning, do not act when you are angry. This is the general teaching of the Prophet ﷺ, that we are not meant to act in anger. But more specifically, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that when we are abused, when a Muslim is attacked, insulted, that is a time to show even more restraint, to show even more sabr. And this was the example that the Prophet ﷺ left us himself. This was his own example. As Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, describing the Prophet ﷺ, وَمَنْ تَقَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِنَفْسِهِ فِي شَيْءٍ قط. She said the Messenger of Allah never avenged himself for his own honor, his own sake, and anything, not once. You know that our Prophet was the most abused Muslim in history. No Muslim in history was abused more than him, insulted more than him, attacked and offended more than him. And yet not once did the Prophet ﷺ avenge himself, defend his honor and avenge his own sake. She said, he never did it once. Except if he saw the law of Allah violated, if he saw the religion of Allah violated, then he would avenge. Then he would get angry for the sake of Allah, not for his own sake. Once, the Prophet ﷺ, he was sitting with Abu Bakr. And a man came and he sat down and he started to insult Abu Bakr, revile Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he stayed quiet. Then for a second time, he started to abuse Abu Bakr, insult Abu Bakr. And for the second time, Abu Bakr, he stayed quiet. And then the man started to insult and revile Abu Bakr a third time. So on the third time, Abu Bakr, he started to defend himself. And we know Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, he would never do or say anything haram. He did not insult the man back. He did not use bad language. He simply defended himself. He defended his honor. So he pushed back at the abuse that this man was hurling at him. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he stood up and he, he left. He started to walk away. So as soon as Abu Bakr saw this, Immediately he got up and he chased after the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, are you upset with me? Did I do something wrong? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, 
يُكَذِّبُهُ بِمَا قَالَ لَكَ When you stay quiet, an angel descended from the heavens and he was belying what this man was saying to you. You could not see him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to defend your honor. فَلَمَّا انْتَصَرْتَ But when you defended yourself, when you avenged your honor, وَقَعَ الشَّيْطَانِ then the angel, he left, and shaitan came instead. Shaitan came, came and said, Hey, what's this? What's going on here? So then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, فَلَمْ أَكُنْ لِأَجْلِسَ إِذْ وَقَعَ الشَّيْطَانِ And I was not going to stay in a place where shaitan has come. When shaitan comes, I leave. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't do anything haram. It was his right to defend himself. And this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even describes the believers. Allah says in Surah Ashura, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْبَغْيُ هُمْ يَنْتَصِرُونَ The believers are the ones who when injustice is done to them, they retaliate, they defend themselves. But what the Prophet ﷺ was teaching Abu Bakr is that even though yes you have the right to defend yourself, there is another option. There is a better way. There is a higher road that we are meant to tread. And that is to forego the retaliation, to endure the abuse, to be patient and suffer the abuse. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself teaches us in the Quran. Because only a few verses after this verse in Surah Shura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Allah says, but as for the one who, sub, who, show, who shows sabr, who endures the abuse, he doesn't retaliate, he endures the abuse, وَغَفَرَ and he pardons and he overlooks, فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ That is the resolve to aspire to. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِنْ عَاقَبَتُمْ فَعَاقِبُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا عُقِبَتُمْ بِهِ So if you decide to retaliate, then retaliate equal to the harm that you have suffered, not more. You do equal to the harm that, has been, that you have suffered. But then Allah says, وَلَئِنْ صَبَرْتُمْ لَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لِلصَّابِرِينَ But if you endure, if you are patient, this is better for those who show patience. Some may say, yes, but this is the time to show strength. This is not the time to show restraint. When these racists, these bigots are throwing bricks at us, destroying, harming the masjid, this is the time to show strength, not weakness. This is the time to retaliate. Brothers, it's not weakness to forego retaliation. It's not weakness to forego vengeance and leave our vengeance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it shows strength. The strength of our faith, the strength of our iman in our hearts. And this strength of faith is what will put fear in the hearts of the disbelievers. Once, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet and the Sahaba, they had gone out on an expedition. And while they were traveling through the desert, they decided to stop and rest. And it was at, at a very hot time of the day, at the middle of the day. So they stopped and they spread out, looking for any shade that could protect them from the heat of the sun. So they all scattered, looking for any tree, any plant. And even the Prophet went looking for a tree until finally he found one and he hung his sword on one of the branches and then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. But while he was sleeping, one of the disbelievers crept up secretly and took his sword out of the scabbard. And he stood above the Prophet ﷺ, holding his sword. So the Prophet ﷺ woke up. So the man, he said, Takhafuni, are you afraid? The Prophet ﷺ, without any hesitation, he said, no. So then the man, he said, minni. Who will protect you from me? So the Prophet ﷺ, Without any doubt, without any fear, with full confidence, he said, Allah. So when the man saw how confident the Prophet ﷺ was, how strong his faith was, his hand started to shake until the sword fell from his hand. So the Prophet ﷺ, he picked up the sword. And then he stood up and he pointed his sword at the man. And he said, minni. Who will protect you from me? Who will protect you from me? So the man, he got on his knees and he said, Kun khayra akhid. 
Be merciful. Have pity on me. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Tashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Do you testify that no one is worthy of worship except Allah? The man said, no. I'm not ready to be Muslim. He said, but I promise you that I will never fight against you, nor will I fight with any other people against you. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, go. You are free. And the man, he left. The Prophet ﷺ didn't retaliate. He didn't respond with evil. The strength of his faith was enough to intimidate the enemies of Allah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله ولكم فاستغفروا كل ذم إن ربي غفور رحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على ربينا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه جمعين أما بعد. Just a few minutes and then we will go for the prayer. When we look to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we find that the Qur'an and the Sunnah teaches to show restraint, to have sabr when we are abused. But there have been some Muslims, especially the young and the foolish amongst the Muslims, who have done the complete opposite of this. Rather than being patient, they have gone out into the streets and responded in the same way that those who attack Islam have responded. They have gone out in mobs, Especially in this city, going out in mobs, trying to show the disbelievers that we can also act just as ignorantly as you. Amr ibn Kuthum, the famous poet of Jahiriya, when he was describing his tribe, Bani Taghlib, and he, was, he wrote in his poem, his Mu'allaqa, that they hung up on the Kaaba, and he was describing the Arabs of Jahiliya, but it was as if he was describing these Muslim youth today. He said, ألا لا يجهل أحد علينا فنجهل فوق جهل الجاهلين. He said, let no one act ignorantly against us, or we will act even more ignorantly, beyond bounds, against them. This is jahiliya. This is not Islam. This is not what Allah teaches us. That if someone does harm to you, you do ten times the harm back. If someone acts like a thug against you, you act ten times back as a thug. This is not what Allah teaches us in the Quran. These youth, they think that if they act this way, if they also attack these disbelievers, this will put fear in their hearts, that this will, this will show strength. Here in this city, as many of you know, a group of these Muslim youth went and they vandalized a pub. They smashed the windows of a pub. This is completely haram. This is completely haram. You are not allowed to do this. This pub is private property. You are not allowed to destroy private property. And the people in the pub, they had nothing to do with the riot. But even if they did, even if all the racists went to this pub to get drunk, that does not give you the right to attack the people in there or to attack the pub. We are not allowed to be vigilantes in Islam. We are not allowed to take the law into our own hands. This is a violation of the Sharia before it's a violation of English common law. Some of these youth, they act as if this is jihad. They act as if this is the battle of Badr. This is not jihad. These racists, these bigots, they are common criminals. They are to be dealt with by the police. We leave them to be dealt with by the police. Just because they're not Muslim and you're Muslim doesn't make this some kind of jihad. But they are right about one thing. This is war. But not the kind of war that they imagine. This is not a war of weapons. This is a war of perception, of image of what the perception of Islam will be in this country. Many of us, we know that the common percep perception of the Muslims is that we are terrorists, that we are violent, that we harm innocent people. And you will not wipe out this perception by terrorizing other people, even if the people you are terrorizing are racists and bigots. If the perception, the misperception of Muslims is that we do harm, you will not wipe away this perception by doing harm to people who may also be evil themselves. Once, after the battle of Uhud, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, a, a chief of one of the tribes came to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why don't you send some of your companions to an najd to Central Arabia, to call the people there to Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, no, I fear for their safety, because there was no peace treaty between the Muslims and these tribes there. So the man, the chief, he said, no, I will be their guarantor. I guarantee their safety. So finally the Prophet ﷺ, he agreed and he chose a group of 70 of his companions to go on this journey. 
And these were some of the best of the, sahab, the Sahaba. Even the Sahaba themselves called this group Al-Qurra, the reciters, because they used to spend their nights reciting the Quran and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this group of Qurra, they went to this, this chief. But this man, this Arab chief, he betrayed the Muslims. And he betrayed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he made a plot with his people to kill the Muslims when they arrived. Nevertheless, the Muslims, they went out. And amongst the Muslims was a man named Haram. Haram ibn Milhan, radiallahu anhu. So when they arrived, Haram, he told his companions, you wait here and I will go and deliver the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to this chief. So he went into the tent of the chief to read the letter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and call the people to Islam. But while he was reading the letter, the chief signaled for his assassin to go behind Harab ibn Milhan with a spear. And when he gave the signal, that man, he stabbed Harab ibn Milhan in the back. He stabbed him in the back with the spear. And he stabbed him so hard that the spear came out from his chest. It went in from his back and came out from his chest. So Harab ibn Milhan, he looked at the spear sticking out of his chest. And you know what he said? You know what he said? The first thought that came in his mind, the first word that comes out of his mouth, he looks down and he said, Allahu Akbar, Fustu, Warabbil Kaaba. He said, Allahu Akbar, I won. I succeeded. I'm a Shaheed. I'm going to Jannah. Warabbil Kaaba, by the Lord of the Kaaba. And then he passed away. But the man who stabbed him, the assassin, Jabbar bin Salma, he said, I couldn't understand why this man would say, I won, when he sees a spear sticking out of his chest. He said, what kind of religion is this that takes men and makes them celebrate when they see death in front of them? He said, so I kept asking my people, asking questions about this man's religion. And, and that image wouldn't leave my mind until I realized whatever faith this man had, whatever belief was in his heart, it must be the truth. And he embraced Islam. And now it's our turn. Now the question is, what image will we leave in the minds of the people of this country? Will it be the image of a mindless mob attacking pubs, attacking disbelievers? Or will it be the image of a people who the more the masjid is attacked, the more frequently they come to the masjid, in larger numbers do they come? Will it be the image of a people who the more they are abused, the more resilient they become, the more steadfast they become. Will it be the image of a people who when they are attacked, the stronger their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes until the people of this country, everyone in Britain, they say, whatever faith these Muslims have, whatever belief is in their hearts, it must be the truth. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the Muslims in this country and all over the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the masajid and to protect the graves of the Muslims. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi Ya ayu al-ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi jma'in Allahumma azzal islam wa muslimin Allahumma azzal islam wa muslimin Allahumma azzal islam wa muslimin wa dammir a'ada al-deen wa ansur ibadak al-muwahideen Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار آمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين